And we have one one visitor here at City Hall. Oh, wonderful. Great. Thanks so, for coming up. <laughs> she's a visitor from California and Germany, wants to see how we do things. Oh, yeah. hey, can you wave? See. Hello. <laughs> well, welcome. Uh, all right, so uh, I'm going to call this meeting to order. Uh, so the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. And I don't think there are any changes to this agenda. Does anyone? Oh, yes, Bill, go ahead. I just suggest that we take the uh, item about the uh, briefing on the, executive, on the security briefing, which is not going to be an executive session, and move it up earlier, uh, maybe to like right after Girton Park or something like that, since it doesn't need to wait till after all the reports. Right, right, absolutely. So we'll we'll just make that the last piece of our um, regular agenda. Regular business. That's fine. Okay. Um, Great. So without objection, we will consider that agenda approved, unless folks have other thoughts. OK. Uh, so the uh, first item on our agenda, well, besides the, oh, um, last time I had accidentally skipped general business and appearances, and it actually doesn't Look like there is general business and appearances, so I'm going to just create that. We, um, no, sir. We are number four. Number four? Yeah, it's listed. I maybe I have an old version. My number four is police committee uh, appointments. Okay. I will uh, put a link to the uh, agenda in the chat, which I will okay. now authorize briefly. Okay. Uh, I just updated mine, and it's it's um, it's there now. Uh, sorry, um, Jack and Donna, did you have a comment? I do not. Uh, okay. Cameron bubbled on me. I, I couldn't understand her. That's oh, what I she, wanted to say. She was going to post the agenda in the chat. Thank you. Yep. Uh, okay. So, uh, general business and appearances. Uh, so. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is otherwise um, not on our agenda. Um, and so if you want to say your name and where you live and try to keep your comments to about two minutes or less, that would be fabulous. Um, and that's true basically throughout the meeting. Um, and if you have a comment that is pertinent to a, uh, one of the agenda items, uh, if you can make it then, that would be great. Uh, all right, so any new folks would like to address the council? You can, yeah. I think, I think our guest would like to speak. Fabulous. So now you can speak as a Will you just take a seat? Sit down. Yep. Okay. So the volume is okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I just want to say it's lovely to be here. I came back from Europe after a couple of months there. I'm from California, have an interest in natural health care, metabolic therapy, and especially agriculture. So I was just wanting to say uh, Vermont is such a lovely area, even though the transportation is very challenging for me after enjoying the convenience of transportation in Europe. I have lost my physical license, so I can't rent a vehicle at this time. But uh, in terms of agriculture, I would hope to see Vermont take off and go beyond the community plots and so on. And the, uh, you know, the, what I see for evidence of organic and permaculture and hydroponic agriculture here, I think you could really do something spectacular. You could do winter greenhouses and uh, uh, modern digitized agriculture. Uh, Silicon Valley is uh, taking off that way. Uh, India before COVID had about, I don't know, between five and 10 R&D agriculture uh, uh, startups. So, I mean, it's conceivable that a small state with unusual terrain could do something remarkable with agriculture, you know, if you had the right people. So I just wanted to put that out there. 
I'm very concerned about clean food and clean water and clean soil. And Monsanto, by the way, is in process of paying off about 85,000 plaintiffs, which have been deemed, which the judge has ruled uh, uh, suffered cancer or death due to the poison Roundup Ready. And the uh, key chemical in Roundup, glyphosate, also replaces human glycine in our DNA's double strand. So it, as a result of that, collagen formation is disrupted. And we all suffer some degree of impairment that way. So that's a new focus for healthcare practitioners <clears throat> who want to take on that challenge. So you can celebrate being the GMO human. Perhaps you never knew that until now. It's taken 40 to 50 years of Monsanto spraying of food crops around the world for that to, you know, happen to such a, an extent. So I left a few uh, printouts here in the room uh, just to remind you of those two those subjects that are of interest to me. So it's wonderful to see your your sophisticated presentation here. It's really exciting. It's uh, an alternate way, and I'm sure there are advantages to this when people can't get together and meet with the, the cohesion of community, you know, in physical proximity. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. And if you wouldn't mind, what is your, uh, what's your name and where do you live? Uh, Jacqueline Kant, I've been in Germany. I'm from California. I will probably go back to Germany soon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So uh, the next uh, item is the appointment of, or actually, I'm sorry, before we move on, is there anyone else who would like to address the council? Uh, Steve Whitaker. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, I am going to just talk peripherally in my comment about the Garden Park, but I, I want to point out that the, so far, the, at the end of the last meeting, for y'all to execute the approve executing the contract with no access to the bathrooms in the transit center, and and then to be talking, I went and talked to the folks who use that shelter on a daily basis, and I just want to think that y'all are either oblivious or cruel that you think you can just disregard and take away what little so few what few little so few people have in the way of access to a bathroom or a place to you know get their meal or hang out with a little privacy so i could go on and on i've sent donna barlow casey a list of uh maintenance issues that i've been raising for over three years now none of which have been addressed so i think y'all need to really take a, a wake-up call and question whether you're effective at getting any of this stuff remedied uh and whether or not uh, you need to change, seriously change your uh, approach because so many of the precise, detailed, and solvable issues that I brought before you have been swept aside. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. And we'll, I have no doubt that we will continue to talk about um, those things. So, all right. I guess my point is talking about it and solving them is two different things. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Um, anyone else? And Cameron, is there anyone you are seeing? No, oh, ma'am. Okay. All right. Um, so then um, the next item that we have is um, appointments to uh, the police uh, review committee or the police advisory committee. Uh, and uh, for that, um, what I'd like to do is have folks who are here uh, introduce themselves to us, uh, who are candidates who have got their um, who have applied for that um, committee. And uh, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about your thoughts on policing, and um, and then. Once we've had the opportunity to 
hear from all the folks who are uh, candidates here, then uh, we'll go as a council, we'll go into executive session and uh, we'll come back uh, to make some appointments. Um, so I'm thinking that we should go, um, I, I see some folks here already who uh, have applied and so my one thought was would be that um, I may just call on you in the order in which you appear on my screen, um, which I realize may not be the same for everyone, um, but just for, um, for an order. So the, the way you all are appearing on my screen right now um, is um, Michael Sherman and then Kenny Sachs. Um, and then um, just to double check, um, Uh, I just want to make sure, um, uh, Dr. Eric Jacobson, you you were not a candidate, is that correct, or are you? You are. Yes. Okay, yes. okay, so Eric. Um, okay. Dan and, Toll is on. Alyssa yep. Sharon. Yep, so we'll go Michael, uh, Kenny, uh, er, uh, uh, Eric Jacobson, um, and then Alyssa Shuren, and then Dan Towell. Um, and who am I missing? I have people in the rest of my screen. I think that is it. Okay. All right. So, um, welcome. Thanks for uh, being here and, and taking the time to uh, introduce yourselves to us. Uh, so, uh, Michael, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you for uh, this time. Um, I'm Michael Sherman. Uh, I live on College Street. I'm a, been a resident of Montpelier for over 30 years. Um, and I'm also a member of the um, Social Economic and Justice uh, Advisory Committee, CJAC. Um, and part of my application, as I, as I, I suppose you read, is that um, CJAC would like to be represented um, on this committee, um, and um, I, I am the one who um, volunteered to sort of do, do that. Um, um, I, I want to make clear I would not be a spokesperson for the committee because the committee has not taken any position on it on policing yet, but um, I, I would be the you know, eyes and ears and would try to speak for myself. Um, and if the the, if the committee does um, take a position, I certainly would report that. Um, thoughts on policing? Well, um, I, I've been reflecting a, a lot over the past many months about um, my own experience with the police. Um, I am a I, I sort of came to adulthood in the 60s um, and probably one of the formative uh, motion moments of my time personally with police was in Chicago in 1968 which was a ter terrible time uh, with the assassination of Martin Luther King um, and the sort of explosion in the west side of Chicago the police were advised by Mayor Daley at that point to uh, shoot to uh, maim uh, looters and shoot to kill arsonists um, and it became a kind of war between the police and the, the black community on the west side, um, kind of a culmination of a, a growing um, discom discomfort and also a kind of generation gap war between the police and younger people opposing the Vietnam War. Um, that culminated, as you probably know, at the 1968 convention, uh, Democratic Party convention where the police basically rioted and were indiscriminately beating up uh, people who were in, in Grant Park. I was there for uh, some parts of that and, um, and it was a horrifying experience and a, and a demoralizing experience. And it really uh, started my, you know, me thinking about the relationship between the police and, and, and communities, especially in times of conflict and protest, and um, what is their role um, uh, 
um, and and how do we defend democracy at, uh, at, and, and maintain some some boundaries of of, of civility. Um, so in uh, in the recent months, of course, with all of what's going on, I've been collecting articles. Uh, mostly articles by um, people who've been studying the police over many, many years, and I'm interested in this. I also have a personal connection to it because my son is a park ranger in the Grand Canyon. Park rangers are sworn, officer, uh, sworn officers of the federal government. Um, so he's a law enforcement agent, and he and I have had a number of interesting uh, conversations over the past several months about the role of the police and their and the way in which police uh, are trained, um, the kinds of constraints and the kinds of uh, ambiguities that exist. So um, I have a kind of resource at hand that I would like to bring to uh, um, any participation that you any participation in this committee that you might, if you choose to appoint me. Um, are any questions that you have of me? Thank you, Michael. Um, any Thank you. questions? Yeah, any questions from council? That was very helpful. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, Kenny. Hi, hi, Ann. Hi. I heard okay. Yes, we can hear you just fine. Yeah. So, um, so my name's Kenny Sachs. I've been also living in Montpelier for it'll be thirty years. Uh, next week, I moved here from Canada, and um, this is my home now. I've been here, you know, we've sort of, anyway, I don't want to get into politics, but um, I'm really happy here. And um, I just retired for the second time in June. I've been a teacher for the last 20-odd uh, years, um, 16 at U32, and then the last three years at um, Maple Hill School in Plainfield. I'm a special educator. Um, I work with kids with significant emotional issues. That became my specialty over the years. And um, I saw this notice about this oversight committee. I, I'm not sure if there's an official title, but um, I've been looking for something to, some way to involve myself in the community now that I have the luxury of time. And um, this sort of, I think this could be really good. Um, my thoughts on police, I, I don't have an agenda. I know we're hearing a lot of defund police everywhere, and I think it's an unfortunate term. Um, I prefer something, you know, rethink, redesign, re-look, reassess, um, rather than just say, cut everything. Um, I've never had an issue with Montpelier police per se. I've never had an issue with police in Vermont. Um, I couldn't say the same thing when I lived in Montreal. I didn't have personal um, experiences, but um, I knew that I didn't want to mess with police in Montreal. Um, here, I've never felt in any way threatened, but, you know, I'm of the demographics that, the demographic group that is not usually threatened by police. So, um, I don't know what else I could add. I'm just, I'm very interested. I, again, I don't have an agenda. I would like to participate and I think I have some, something to offer. Great, thank you. Any questions from the council? Okay, um, all right. Uh, Dr. Eric Jacobson. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, I, um, I just, uh, uh, just found out about the meeting a few minutes ago, so I, I am not entirely prepared to speak, but I, I could tell you a little bit about myself. Um, uh, I'm Eric Jacobson. I, uh, live on College Street. We moved to Montpelier about four years ago from Corinth via London, and, uh, my wife and I and our, um, now nine-year-old son, uh, were there for... 10 years, he was born there. And prior to that, I was in Berlin, and I was in Vermont in the 80s. I grew up in New York City. Um, my, uh, so I'm a professor. I teach um, philosophy and religion 
and ethics. Um, I've been involved as a head of department of a city university in London in an inner city uh, setting. Uh, so I am familiar with the responsibilities of being um, uh, responsible for young people and um, um, perhaps uh, the responsibilities of working within a, a, a social and uh, structure. Um, what else can I tell you? I've done some human rights work uh, and community organizing over the years. Uh, 1991 to 1993, I was in New York City and I did community organizing in Harlem that had a human rights and civil rights uh, dimension. I, um, I guess before that, 1988-89, I did um, human rights work which related to civilian population in, the, in Israel and Palestine. And so from that point forward, I've had a, an ongoing interest in um, civics and human rights, and I've taught that in London. Uh, and now we're in, we're in Montpellier, and happy to uh, be of service. I do have to say that I, I, I also play a role at the, uh, in the Council of the Hunger Mountain Food Co-op, and I am aware that I might have to take a leadership role in this coming year. So there is one... Um, concern that I have about an additional commitment, but I, I am uh, interested and open. And maybe the last thing I should say is that I had an opportunity to meet Chief Pete during one of his um, meet and greet sessions when he first came and uh, spoke with him and was very impressed with him and with his appointment. Uh, so I'll leave it there and open to any questions that you have. Thank you. Um, any questions from council? Okay, thank you. Um, Dan, Dan was, oh, he was here. Dan seems to have disappeared. Um, okay, um, so uh, we'll skip Dan for now, see if he comes back. Um, and uh, so on to Alyssa, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Uh, well, I'm Alyssa Sharon. I live in Montpelier and have been here for the last 20 years, which makes me feel so old to say that number now. Hope I don't look it. Just kidding. Um, my husband and I are have been active in the community here. My son is at Union Elementary. Um, and before moving to Montpelier, I lived in Hartford, Connecticut. And before that, Boulder, Colorado, and before that, in San Francisco. So have had an opportunity, well, and, you know, in those different places, uh, have done uh, environmental or social justice work. Um, so have had an opportunity to see the way police have functioned in um, smaller and larger contexts. Professionally, over the last 20 years, uh, in addition to nonprofit work, I've also done government work. And with the last three and a half years, I've worked with the Management Center Telecommuting from Montpelier, uh, which is an, it's a nonprofit based in D.C. that has clients all across the country uh, that we support through a management lens. So my role is to help elected and appointed officials run their offices. And... Uh, which is a, is um, a real privilege to do. And I've got to see a lot of different models around the way different offices uh, are run. And as part of that work, I have been uh, working over the last three and a half years, a lot on criminal justice reforms issues. So my background is in environmental uh, and policy issues, environmental policy issues. And I had kind of come up through uh, doing environmental advocacy and then running the environmental department for the state of Vermont uh, as commissioner and deputy commissioner there. Uh, over the last three and a half years, I have worked with probably in some capacity, I would say 25 or so different prosecutors offices who are doing reform oriented uh, work and trying to change the criminal justice system from the inside. And through that work, I have had the opportunity to work um, also with the police and do stakeholder processes both internally and in folks' the offices around um, culture change, uh, around the issue of criminal justice, and then also, um, you know, doing some community engagement, whether that's surveying, uh, 
um, focus groups like analysis of the data that comes in and helping to map out paths on um, these issues moving forward. So I'm very interested in um, policing in our community. And when this opportunity came up, I was thinking, oh, this would be a great way to um, try to learn from some of the models and things that I've seen in other places across the country and maybe utilize those here, right here in my um, backyard. Uh, and maybe that's some of the management skills I've outlined, and maybe that's just some of the some of the models that I've been uh, had a benefit uh, to see more um, up close and personal. Uh, so I think I would be really interested in more of a, a data driven approach to engaging in this topic, and a real community based approach uh, to engaging in this topic. And I would be excited to work with people who are. Uh, you know, also um, interested in, in that type of approach. Uh, my opinion on police generally, uh, you know, I have seen successful community-based, uh, you know, community-oriented policing models. I tend to think that, um, you know, areas of interest for me uh, would be to make sure that the way that we're utilizing our police are um, in the in the past and most, uh, like in the ways they are most comfortable and trained to be utilized and that we are maximizing our social service and, um, you know, social systems that exist and, and make sure that uh, police role is um, more limited and targeted, though I think that community-based relationships can be uh, very broad and very strong. So, you know, I think we get, I think we would do the work to figure out what, how exactly how to thread this needle in, in our community and the types of investments that we would want to be making here. But um, that just gives you a little bit of a flavor uh, of my approach. And at this point, I feel like I'm still a bus during, so I'm going to end and see if you have any questions. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. All right, so I see uh, Dan is back, which is great. Um, and also uh, Jen uh, Duggan, or Dugan, I'm not sure how to say your name, but um, just noticing that you're on here as well. Um, so let's have uh, Dan uh, go introduce himself, uh, and then Jen, just so you're aware, we're having all the folks who have applied for the um, Police uh, Advisory Committee uh, introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their thoughts on policing. Um, so Dan, uh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, can you hear me okay, Ann? Yep. I, I was having technology issues, so I tried to dial in and that didn't work. So now I'm back video. Um, first of all, I just want to start out by saying that the, my primary lens for coming to this committee is as uh, someone to represent the voice of those with mental health conditions and their loved ones, you know, and, and then more broadly, uh, those that are marginalized. My thoughts on police, I have a great respect for law enforcement, particularly here in Montpelier in Vermont after living in Southern New England for most of my life. Uh, I've also met uh, Chief, uh, Chief Pete and corresponded with him and I'm very optimistic about his leadership here in our lovely city. Um, but at the same time, um, in, the, in my work and in my volunteer efforts in, in the mental health peer and peer support community, I've seen some of the uh, abuses and some of the uh, negative impacts. And so, um, I, you know, I hope to bring to this committee, a, you know, sort of a balanced approach with, um, you know, with a representing the, 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 the mental health perspective. I myself was diagnosed with a, a major mood disorder over 35 years ago and struggled with stigma and discrimination in, in, the, in corporate America. Moved to Vermont five years ago and, and got involved in, in the mental health community as a peer support worker. I answer calls for Pathways Warm Line. I also uh, facilitate support groups, uh, peer support groups at uh, CVMC and um, and the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. I'm also a passionate uh, volunteer mental health and peer support advocate. Uh, I sit on a number of statewide committees, including the uh, Department of Mental Health's um, Adult State uh, Program Standing Committee. And in that role, um, I have developed over the last four years, four or five years, 
connections and relationships and knowledge of practices throughout the state, including, um, including with law enforcement. Um, and finally, throughout my life, I've been very civic, uh, very um, involved in, in civic activities. Currently, I'm on the board of the Cross Vermont Trail Association and I'm a past chairman of the Onion River Exchange. To me, helping and con contributing to my community is, a, is an absolute core value. And I hope to bring um, my experience uh, here in Vermont, as well as the uh, corporate experience uh, as a, a finance and process improvement consultant to this very important committee. Great, thank you, Dan. Um, any welcome. questions? Yeah. Okay, uh, and Jen. Hi, good evening. It's Duggan. Duggan, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, um, hi everybody. Um, my name is Jen Duggan and um, I am, you know, I guess I can start with my, you know, thoughts on policing and why I'm am interested in serving on this committee. Um, you know, I have a deep respect um, for law enforcement. Um, you know, at the same time, I think that we have to begin to grapple and confront systemic racism as it shows up in law enforcement and all of our institutions. Um, and so this, the committee's focus um, in terms of looking at data and trends and really grappling um, with realities um, and that, that approach being very data-driven was is very interesting um, to me. Um, I feel like that's a really important place to ground the conversation. Um, and, you know, I am really um, appreciate the opportunity to look at this um, issue in a systemic way. Um, and um, thinking about um, how we balance um, the, the benefit, um, you know, that our police um, provide to the community, all of the positives while we are working to, um, you know, to address systemic racism and getting very real about that. Um, you know, I think that we um, as a community um, have said all the right things. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm really hopeful that this is the first step to moving towards action, to really identifying um, those inequities that are surfacing in our, um, you know, police systems um, in our community, and identifying um, the actions that we're going to do to disrupt that. And so, that's a little bit about um, my interest in serving on the committee. You know, I also really um, believe in this community, um, and would be, you know, really honored to to volunteer my time and, and serve in this capacity. Um, I think that, you know, I have a lot of different, um, you know, skill sets in my in, in my background. Um, I um, have been engaged in, you know, both nonprofit advocacy, working on environmental justice issues and pollution issues, as well as um, working in state government. So I bring a variety of different perspectives. Um, and I'll just stop there, um, but happy to answer any questions. Um, Great. Thank you. Um, any questions? Okay. <clears throat> um, so in the meanwhile, has anyone else shown up? <clears throat> Madam Mayor, Madam, Madam Mayor, this is Stephen Whitaker. Yes, Stephen, I did go express ahead. The at the last time y'all took this up, I did express interest. Uh, I would like you to clarify how you see the evolution of whether this might be a formative exploratory committee, but in the context of the budget emergency that we're facing, uh, maybe it has a more important charge, or you were that this committee might lead to a police oversight commission that would do the, the dirty work. I have already expressed to the council uh, in my 30 odd years in Montpelier that I've been uh, both on the good side and the bad side. 
I don't think we're only dealing with racial discrimination here. We've got class discrimination. We've got home discrimination, et cetera. Uh, we've got, you know, I've been stolen from. I've been yanked down the stairs in cuffs by John Martin. May he rest in peace. Uh, for attending an open meeting of the 911 board, which I was serving on a subcommittee of. So I've seen both the good side and the under, dark underbelly of this police force. And I think I would provide a valuable contribution to asking the tough questions and doing so in a timely manner so that if we do need to make some serious budget cuts in the next year, uh, we do that in an informed way. I, I do think we're disproportionately over-policed and under-prepared uh, with the mental health. Witness the assassination of uh, Mark Johnson, so, which is still being investigated. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, is there anyone else um, who I've missed? Okay. All right, so uh, at this point, what, unless there's any other comments or thoughts from council. Um, um, yes, Donna, go ahead. I wasn't sure whether you heard from any of the other candidates. Sometimes they email us when they can't attend. That is a good question. And I did not, I did not hear from any of the other uh, candidates and I'll put that out yeah. to the rest of the council. Anyone else? We heard? didn't at city hall. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Jay, did I see a hand? Yes. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> All right. So at this point, I think, uh, so we're going to go into um, executive session. Uh, Jack. Yes. Pursuant to 1BSA section 313A3, I move that we go into executive session to consider the appointment of a public official. Second. Second. <laughs> oh, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, great. So we have a motion and a second. Um, I don't really know how long we'll be. So um, I'm going to guess that because we're appointing quite a few, or actually, I'm not, we're not even, we have yet to decide how, how big it will be. Um, so there's a number of things for us to discuss. So um, <clears throat> when, and when we come back, we'll, um, we'll make some appointments. All right, so any further discussion? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. All right. Yeah, the, the discussion of the size, that doesn't seem like it would be appropriate for executive session. Uh, oh, and thank you. You could skate right into it but and do them both at once, but I'm trying, struggling to get there. That is a good point. Thank you. I'm just going to suggest the same thing, Dave. Yep. Um, well, and at Dan, go ahead. some point, we have to decide how many to appoint today, whether that's the size yeah. of the committee or not. That's true. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, um, in addition, um, the last time I took, spoke to uh, the chief of police, he did not have a good uh, sense of what the time commitment would, would be and, and um, you know, more specifically what you were thinking, you know, in terms of the uh, roles and responsibilities beyond what was outlined. So if there's any more thoughts in, in that regard, um, that would be helpful. Yes, that, that is a good question. Um, so. Perhaps before we go, we actually go into executive session, we should um, clarify uh, a few things here. <clears throat> so if yes, I may, Mayor, well, I just on behalf of the council, and I'm sure they'll, they'll correct me if I'm incorrect, the, the, what was written, the summary of activity was the product of a pretty long council discussion as to what was the plan was. And so I think that that is the work they expect. Uh, as per an earlier comment, if if the group comes back and says we recommend the following as an ongoing group or or whatever, then then you could either choose to continue yourselves or recommend that it be reformed. So, uh, I think the council's thought was the, the the sort of task laid out was the defined task for this initial group, and then uh, take the recommendations of that group as far as moving forward. And if someone wants to correct me, I'm happy to be corrected. No, I think that's fair. Um, Lauren, go ahead, and then Donna. Um, that, that's that's accurate, and you know I think we had some discussion about the the group that gets appointed, really looking at the charge and kind of digging into what that will look like, and deciding on a schedule that will work for the people who are appointed. As you know, as you kind of 
take a look at that scope and you know some committees have come back and refined it and you know made, made a suggestion to council of here's what we're thinking that this means to us is that right are we on the right track um, so I could see this committee since you know it's a brand new one doing that kind of approach um, so I think they're I would see it as a, as a function to some degree about the group that gets together and how they lay out you know what kind of schedule they want to get for what kind of um, products and and working from it from there which I know is unsatisfying when you're trying to look at the time commitment but that was what we had talked about yep. and uh, O'Donna go ahead well along those lines I wasn't sure if everybody online realized that attached to the agenda there are six points of references of what we're expecting the committee to do and one is as Laura Lauren mentioned number six talks about making recommendations for future charge and functions but it's a pretty broad scope right now um, so if you haven't seen this if you double click on the agenda you can review it so um, as to the number of um, folks on the committee I would um, I feel like that that's something we should discuss before we go into executive session. Um, I'm, I'm going to put out there that I, I think we should be looking for an odd number of people and probably no more than nine. Um, I think beyond nine, it gets kind of unwieldy. Um, other thoughts? Uh, Bill, go ahead. Just point of information. Uh, I believe you had said at the last meeting you were planning to put two council members on as well so yeah. if you had nine you'd be looking at seven additional people i think you just try yeah. to be clear about that right so. yep thank you um any other um well, uh comments yes dan sure i'll i'll, I'll simply add um i think nine might be a little bit big um because this isn't necessarily a supreme court um uh, body that need but at the same time um I, th I think one thing that's really nice is both the people who the applicants who've come tonight as well as the applicants there ha have really reflect a number of diverse um points of view and backgrounds and so you know i'm I understand that it's not appropriate for a um, executive session to put the discussion of, of how many members were on, um, but um, you know I, I think nine is a cap. I think five would be sort of a, a minimum. Like we wouldn't want um, less than five. Um, in addition. You know, I think it's also helpful for everyone to know as far as their commitment goes. I, I've actually reached out to Norwich University um, and they have an intern program and there's some preliminary conversation um, about allowing um, an intern to help staff this committee from their criminal justice department. Um, it's not set in stone, but um, they, they have an intern program where they provide both access to the uh, the student as well as some of the supporting professors as far as doing some of the data collection um, and heavier lifting that we might expect this committee. So the, the good news is that I don't think we would have committee members being required to do some of that um, and there would be some assistance available. So, um, you know, I think that that may help in that you don't necessarily need nine ors because there's no source of support. Um, at the same time. Um, so I, for me, the big consideration is really looking for a diverse number of voices on, on this board that reflects really the, the conversations we've been having and hearing here at City Council as well as outside. Um, so that's my, those are my two cents. Donna, go ahead. So are you actually looking for a motion of a number? I mean, I like the range of five to nine that Dan mentioned. I'd be willing to make a motion that we go with the range of five to nine members, including that includes the two city council members. That sounds good to me. Yeah. Second, anybody? Second. Oh. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion and a second. 
Um, any further discussion on the number of folks? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed. Okay, so thank you for that. It's good clarification. Um, and so I, I don't think we actually did, I'm having a hard time remembering if we actually voted to go into executive session. I think we this not, was a I, Russian nesting doll. Yeah, right. Yeah, so we, we did have a motion in a second um, to go into executive session. Um, is there anything further on that? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay, and opposed. Okay, all right, well, we will be back, hopefully soon. Out of executive session. So moved. Second. Okay, uh, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, uh, so is there a motion? I'll make a motion. Um, I move that we appoint the following individuals to the police review committee uh, Michael Sherman, uh, Alyssa Shern, uh, Dan Toll, Jem Duggan, uh, and then two council representatives, Lauren uh, Hurl and Jack McCullough. Second. Okay, any further discussion there? Um, I, I just want to say to um, everyone who applied um, for this, we're so grateful for uh, your interest. Um, and actually, I think um, I might have more about uh, more to say about this in a, in a, in a little bit. Um, I have a second motion. Uh, yes, yes, exactly. So, um, <coughs> So there's a, but a, a motion and a second. Um, so any further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed. Okay, thank you. And um, yes, yeah, so Dan, anything further? Or uh, Lauren, go ahead. So I was just going to make a motion that we appoint Jeremy Beaudry and Samuel Lynch to the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee. I'll second. Further discussion there? No. Um, yeah, go ahead. I'll just, I'll just simply add that they had indicated that they were interested in participating in the Social and Economic Justice Committee as well as the Police Review Committee. Um, and so given that there are openings and that there are um, that we've advertised for his position previously, um, I feel justified in making these additional appointments of these two individuals. Okay. Um, all right, so there's been a motion and a second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed? Okay, so that um, passes. And then uh, Dan. Yes, um, I'd like to make another motion. I'd like to add Make a motion that we add to the scope of the police review committee uh, the following charge that the committee shall um, meet and reach out to potential stakeholders and review whether additional uh, members should be added to the police review committee and make such recommendations to us within uh, the first 60 days uh, of their um, uh, existence as a committee. Second. Okay. Um, any further discussion about this, uh, Jack? It's I mean, it's worth pointing out that we had a large number of applications for this uh, committee. Um, anyone who's not been put on the committee tonight but did apply is is potentially still in play, and uh, but we could also be reaching out to other people once we look around the table and see who's not there who really should be. Yeah. Okay, any further discussion on on the this uh, additional scope? 
Um, Michael, go ahead. Oh, and then Dan, yeah. I just want to know um, who's going to convene this committee and when? Good question. <laughs> Good question. Coming. We'll figure that out. Okay. Yeah, usually my office helps set that up, and I would assume that one of the one or both of the city councils will take the lead in terms of establishing the first meeting, and then we'll all decide to have a governing Okay, thanks. And um, anything to add, Dan? Um, well, first, I just wanted to thank you for appointing me to the committee and and uh, make give you my commitment that I will work as hard as I can and try to involve as many many uh, as possible of the stakeholders uh, as we go through this process. And also, um, I'm really pleased to hear uh, Dan's uh, comment about expanding the committee um, because I, uh, it, it strikes me that I, if I count it correctly, there are six of us initially, that it would be yeah. great to have at least uh, a handful more to, to, so we have a broader set of stakeholders so you know, kudos to you for for that piece of it as well so thank you thank you yeah so i guess um i, I would just also add i'm also very grateful for everyone who applied to this committee um and uh and as uh jack and dan mentioned uh, we I don't feel done with the the folks necessarily who are on this committee, um, but uh, are uh, looking for uh, potentially a um, uh, variety of voices. So I just want to leave that, that out there. And in the meanwhile, we're just uh, uh, very grateful for uh, your dedication and, and service on this committee. So uh, there's been a, a motion and a second about this, uh, the scope, and um, looking at, at the uh, folks on the committee. Um, is there, there was a second, so any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed. Okay, all right, thank you again, everyone. And, um, I guess either Bill or city councilor um, or some city staff will be in touch about getting together. It will be the person who actually runs everything, Mary Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Super. All right. Well, so we are going to um, move on then to the consent agenda. Uh, is there a uh, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Um, I'll move that we accept the consent agenda. Second. Okay, uh, motion and a second. All in favor, or any further discussion on the consent agenda? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. All right, so that passes. Um, on to legislative priorities. Uh, Anne? Yes, Donna. Uh, Jenna Claire was there. Maybe she wanted to say something. I think she may have disappeared, but that's okay. Did Actually, I was just here in case there were any questions. Thank you, Donna. Okay. Super. Uh, all right. So for the legislative agenda, um, I I assume I'm either turning this over to Bill or to Connor or uh, one of the basically one of the um, folks from the group. If anyone from the group wants to start, that's fine. Good either way. I, you know, I, uh, I'll just say that we, we met a couple of times there. Um, this is building off the work we did uh, last legislative session, which, which I, th I think everybody would agree it, it was a good conversation um, we had with our legislative delegation. And this agenda, um, I think, is meant to be um, sort of interpreted pretty broadly with sort of the principles and everything. Uh, because we really, we don't know what we don't know at this point. And the elephant in the room is, you know, as the pandemic keeps going here, um, there's going to be a lot of sources to tap for, additional revenue, hopefully. And it's going to be a matter of just keeping sort of the eye on the prize here. Uh, but this is really a foundation. We, we 
we had it bigger at first and we, you know, had added a lot of stuff that we really think we need some discussion with our legislative delegation just to see what's possible. Um, and then there are other items, you know, in terms of, you know, policing and everything. Um, but I, I think we want to hear some feedback from the group we just appointed before taking any positions at the legislature, what we're looking at. Um, but definitely things like, you know, postponing reappraisals, pushing that back, um, you know, pushing for any charter changes. We still got a while to get it on the, um, on the ballot for March there. I think January we have to do. Um, and I, I think it's a good collaborative exercise. We, we've also discussed the potential of bringing more community members maybe people who are already at the state house already sitting in these uh, committees who can give us a heads up because, you know, some of this is going to be uh, offense, but a lot of it's going to be defense with what's coming our way there. So uh, other things we added, like, you know, maybe look at, as we're looking at public restrooms, is there a partnership we could have with the state there, given that this is the capital, um, a lot of tourists coming into town and everything, and they might be using it. So, you know, discussions like that, but I'll quit yapping and if anybody else wants to weigh in. So procedurally, the plan was, you know, this committee came up with this draft. If the council is generally okay with this draft, what we were going to do is um, we'll wait till next Tuesday's election and see who is elected to our, our delegation and then invite those folks uh, to our meeting probably on the 18th of November uh, to review the draft and see what they, you know, get their input on what's possible, as we said, and what hot issues they see, and then after that, adopt a final version beginning of December that we can actually say, here is our legislative policy, so to speak, and here is um, what we're giving. So I think today was, is this the right direction or the things you want to add, subtract, ask questions about, uh, you, you know, that before we uh, send a draft out and invite the legislators. Donna. Um, thank you all for doing this work. When I was reading it over, it seemed that some things could be lumped together and then with headings, like a broad heading about net zero energy and then more of the specifics that are now in like a couple of different items. And likewise about government, con you know, more municipal control. I think those could go under a heading and then under those you have a, 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 like two or three items. I just feel it's sort of scattered, you know, and I'd like to see it more focused so that you're concerned about local control. And these are the reason, these are the things we got to watch for. We're concerned about net energy. These are the things we want to watch for. Uh, and I would like to see, you know, the council look at that if it were to be redone and have us prioritize them. I think that's also important. But I thank you for your work. It gave me a lot of thought. Well, I would, I can offer, and I'm fairly confident because I don't think it's that heavy a lift, um, we could probably have that reformatted for next week's meeting. And then you could just take a look at that. And if you said we want to prioritize it, and by then we at least, we would know who the delegation was, but we can at least, and we can still send them the final version after next week. And because we won't be inviting them till at least fourth anyway. So, uh, Lauren, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a great idea, Donna. I make it more clear and some priorities and there's some things that, you know, we'd want to maybe make clear that we want to make sure the city's actually engaging in versus things we're just kind of monitoring and assume that other entities will be advancing. And if we were invited or something, maybe we'd support it. Um, so that'd be great to have some more clarity. Um, I mean, I, I'm viewing this as iterative, wanting to hear what the delegation has to say. And if there's you know, big things that aren't on our radar, but that would have big implications for the city that we might add things or or shape as well. I mean, I think getting it more organized for the delegation before we send it to them um, is a great first step, but I also think it'll um, probably change a little from there, either from input from staff or from the delegation uh, before, you know, and as we get clarity of other kind of big ideas that are gonna be part of the discussion this year at the State House that we think we might wanna weigh in on. Thanks. So um, one possibility is that maybe we put off approving this, this tonight for it to be reorganized and bring it up again at the next meeting. Um, how are people feeling about that? 
Uh, Jack, go ahead. That's fine with me. Uh, uh, as far as the substance of this goes, I, I don't have any problem now saying, yeah, this is on the right track. And if, uh, if people want to uh, do some work on organizing or rephrasing things, then uh, that that is fine, but I'm not, I haven't seen anything here that, that I would say, well, this committee is way off base. This isn't what the city, uh, where the city should be going at all. And I think that giving some kind of even just a general, yeah, you're on the right track is probably a good idea. Other thoughts? No, oh, okay. Um, so, um, yeah, go ahead, Bill. No, that's fine. And one of the things we talked about with the committee, we had had a list that had been staff issues that they were tracking. And we took that off because it was just the council. So I'll see if we can get at least the, their preliminary list for next week as well. Okay. All right. So maybe um, uh, it sounds like maybe we're not going to take any action on this tonight and we'll take this up again um, another time unless folks have other thoughts and would like to move forward. Uh, go ahead, Dan. Sorry, uh, not to belabor this. I mean, I, I feel comfortable moving forward on it. Of course, I was on the committee that helped draft this as well. Um, and, you know, I think we could go we could simply approve it tonight and um, reformat it later because I think it's really a formatting issue. Um, and since the consensus is there, I guess that's the way I would favor. But I'm also fully comfortable waiting to next week if people want to see it reorganized. That's that's fine. Donna, how do you feel about that? Uh, it's part of just my mindset. I can't figure out exactly what's missing until because it's so scrambled. And so that was my issue. It's like, what is this saying? So I tried to organize it with darts of what was connected and, but fine, I can, I can pass it tonight if the group wants to. I just find it not letting me know what's missing because it's not organized. That's all. But I'll add things later when they come up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Don't make a motion, Dan. Okay. Well, I'll move that we approve our um, legislative priorities um a legislative agenda the as submitted okay is there a second okay second. we get a second uh and any further discussion uh jack one one thought and i don't want to get into nitpicky uh comments and of course anytime says that someone says that it's because they're about to make a nitpicky picky comment but uh, but for item four, for the support funding for public restrooms to serve visitors to state and city facilities, I, I'm not sure exactly what the uh, language should be, but I think that phrasing it that way makes it seem, kind of seem like we're saying it's for tourists, where we it is for tourists, but it's also for Montpelier residents who live here but do not have uh, homes and uh, and need a place to go to the bathroom. So as it's, I, I'm fine with passing it and saying, let's, I'll tweak, that a little. let's tweak that language, yeah. yeah. I, and I think that was the intent of the committee was, was that broader, you know, we're seeking funding. Um, we won't have a tourist only badge to activate the restroom. Right. <laughs> okay. I knew that was what we've been talking about all along. So we might as well say that. And I think it's important to say that, that okay. that's, a, that's a, an important value of the city. I agree. Okay, great. Uh, any further discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so that passes. Uh, the COVID nineteen update. Sorry, I have to get situated. All good. 
I am going to do that right now. Okay, I think we should be good. So I'll briefly go through it. It's a pretty big update this week. Um, so in your memo, you'll see that um, the governor is concerned and so are our health, state health officials about the emerging COVID-19 outbreaks that have been occurring in Vermont. The, I want to state what the governor said because I think it's important. Um, he stated that we've gotten complacent in Vermont and that we've let our guard down and we are seeing the effects of that. He says that as Vermonters, we have to reverse the trend of increasing COVID-19 cases through our individual and collective actions. Um, Dr. Levine also stressed the importance of wearing masks in the last few weeks, saying the science around them has grown and that they're known now to protect mask wearers as well as the people in the vicinity, even if they're not wearing a mask, and that um, wearing a mask may also reduce the viral load for people who do end up contracting the virus. So even if you do get sick, if you're wearing a mask, he said that that can actually lessen the impact of the illness. So other updates from the state included an extension of the state of emergency through November 15th. There's also um, been uh, some interesting announcements, including a free community class courses, uh, sorry, free community college courses and training for the next two months to all Vermonters whose work and household situations have changed due to COVID. Um, so that can be accessed at the vsc.edu website. The state also noted that they released a vaccine preparedness plan to the CDC. Um, and they also announced a partnership between UVM and a, a drug trial that will be trialing the, uh, a, a certain vaccine um, that will be hopefully rolling out very shortly. They are looking for volunteers, um, particularly those in the above 65 demographic to help them uh, test this vaccine. So um, some sports updates, the ice rinks have been directed to uh, shut down their schedules for two weeks. That will be through midnight, October 30th. All skating rinks are closed. And uh, they did announce a recreational grant for ski areas um, to help the ski areas provide safe skiing for this season. Um, the grants are up to $200,000 each. They've also expanded the economic recovery grants. Um, so there's a new round available there that can be accessed through the ACCB website. So we're still open as the city, but because of these outbreaks, I do want it to be known that we will probably be uh, looking at our state for any guidance on reclosures. That hasn't been confirmed. I just want to put that in front of you as something that could come back up. Um, but there are some other openings that this uh, city is doing. Our recreation department is going ahead um, with some of the new guidance for winter sports and allowing more types of sports to use our rental facility within the rec, you know, the rec facility. Um, things that have been opened include base uh, five on five basketball and indoor soccer. So we're going to be allowing groups of 10 to rent that space for an hour, an hour only. Um, and then again, uh, community meal information was included in the memo and another way is still looking for donations for camping gear. Does anyone have any questions? Jack, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Cameron. I uh, particularly appreciated the, the pun you squeezed in on the uh, ice rink item there. I took that from the state. Can't claim that. That was funny, <laughs> so I wanted to keep it. Um, the uh, I was just thinking about this the other day with the uh, with the vaccine plan. Will uh, there be uh, a role for uh, municipalities to be involved in uh, rolling that out, or is that all going to be at the state level, or is it unknown yet? My understanding is that it's at the state level, but they will be probably reaching out to Chief Gowans as our official health officer if they do need any assistance. So. If they need anything from us, he'd be their point of contact. Thanks. And because of the outbreaks, I will also say that um, Chief Gowans is working with the state right now to make sure that they can give us a daily update on cases in our area. Um, they have not been able to 
uh, provide that yet, but they are working on that for us. Um, we, we think it's of utmost importance to have a daily update from the state regarding our region. Great, thank you. Uh, Donna. I just also wanna thank Cameron, not only for the details in the report, but these links, I want you to know the trouble you go to put them in there, I use them. It's terrific, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Great, any other questions or comments? I just, um, I wanted to share that as you guys know, I think we um, have been doing some indoor activities and um, have done one meal indoors at the senior center. We opted this week because of the recent rise in COVID locally to cancel the meal that we had intended to host on on Tuesday. Um, you know, despite the fact folks were going to be really far distanced and low numbers and everything, we just decided it wasn't worth the risk. So as we go forward, we're scheduling one indoor meal a month, but all of them will be tentative until such time that we feel that it's truly safe. So we, we continue with a few indoor activities with small numbers and masking and health screening and everything. And um, if you guys have any questions about senior center operations while I'm on tonight, I'm happy to answer them. Great, thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, all right, well, thanks again, Cameron. Thank you. And yeah, so we're gonna uh, move on then to a uh, discussion about uh, the Girton Park structure. Um, so uh, the, this uh, is a, carryover item from last meeting. Um, and just so you all are aware, I I did uh, try to reach out to Paige to uh, get her thoughts and feedback, but I, we were not able to connect, unfortunately. Um, so I, I don't have myself much to update there. Um, other thoughts on this? So, um, so we do have a, this recommendation about um, moving it. So um, I, I will just say, at least for my part, um, from the conversations that I have had with folks um, using that space, um, that there's a, a range of opinions actually about uh, the future of that structure. Um, and that, but, uh, but folks were, um, that at least the folks that I talked to were not like adamant that it stay there. Um, and I, you know, it's a, it is kind of a cool spot uh, in, in the world in general. And I think um, potentially something else, like we could continue to like imagine um, what might work better in that space. Um, so that's uh, just another possibility something that I want to uh, put out um, there for you all. Um, other thoughts? on possibility of moving that structure. Uh, Dan. Sure. Um, I've received a couple comments from constituents and um, who have been in favor of moving the pocket park out of that, or sorry, the structure out of that particular location. Um, you know, and the stated reasons are that, um, you know, it's a particularly tight corner. There's fences on either side that force everyone going up and down that particular area to be within a narrow corridor and especially given um, the way in which we are currently um, having to distance try and distance when especially out on the pocket park um, a number of constituents said that they felt uncomfortable with that and so you know my own experience and i wouldn't necessarily substitute that for a broader um, is consistent with that. Um, you know, it's not that the uh, structure is, uh, I mean, it's a beautiful structure. Um, I think the alternative location at the, the pump park is a good location. Um, and, you know, I don't think we abandoned that, that spot, but I think whatever goes in, I don't know if that's the best spot for a structure 
but I think we need to rethink that entire stretch from really that bridge um, all the way to the other bridge um, and how people use that space um, and how they are using that space. Um, we've received complaints about, I've received complaints about, you know, other uses along that corridor, um, you know, that have, um, that are disruptive. And I think it's, you know, I think we have to rethink about how, how, how we use that to the best of our advantage as a city and as a community, as a welcoming and opening place. And, you know, I don't think that removing this changes the character of that. Um, I think it, it, um, it improves that particular junction. And I think it's a, it's a conversation we continue to have. Um, and that's my thought. Other thoughts? Thank you. Uh, Donna, go ahead. I know, I'm a minority. I really felt it was an ugly spot before we put it there. And yes, kids have to slow down on their bikes to make the corner. But I hope whatever we replace it with, that it's as pretty and, and really breaks up the whole fence into the parking lot that's behind it there on, on that stretch of the shared use path. So I hope we're not just closing that space off to asphalt. Thank you. I think that's, I think it could be, I've, I've, I've always felt that that spot has a lot of potential. I think it's a really interesting spot. Um, and so I agree. I'm, it, I want it to be, I want it to be special. Like I want it to be awesome. Um, so anyway, other thoughts? Uh, Jack, go ahead. Um, I haven't spent much time on that path uh, that recently as it's gotten colder. Um, I've, I've heard some comments from, uh, from constituents, uh, largely uh, negative about the, about the space and, uh, and what the experience is like to go by there. And it's true, it's a, a bit of a choke point. Um, what, what kind of bothers me is that uh, nobody has actually said this, but there's sort of uh, an undercurrent of uh, this, having this structure there is, uh, is something that attracts homeless people to this place. And, um, and we don't like it for that reason. And if anyone who's written to me I'll say you right now, I know you haven't said that, but, uh, but I'm just, to the extent that that's part of the flavor of the conversation, I think we should uh, have more of a community conversation before uh, making a decision of what to do about it. And, and so I was really kind of surprised that we put it on the agenda for, for this week because it struck me that it was probably premature, but um it it does seem like the kind of thing where we'd like to hear what more of the community has to say about it uh, for whatever it's worth uh, in addition to that just to build on what you're saying jack um uh from the conversations that i've had with folks there it sounds to me as well that like you know not all the folks that are um leaving trash, if you will, um, which is not the only problem, but um, that there, I mean, it's, I, I think that sometimes gets blamed on folks that are homeless, um, but I don't think that that is necessarily always the case. I think there's an assumption there as well, um, which which is not to invalidate your point. I, I, you know, I agree that that's, you know, something that is also true. I just want to also point out that, um, yeah, that the trash is that there's some there's some kind of a Venn diagram there. Um, <laughs> I guess I'll leave it at that. Other thoughts? You're going to take public comment? 
Um, yes. Yeah, and um, now would be fine, Stephen. Okay, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. I don't okay. hang out there, but I do go and check on it and the people there regularly for several years now. And I've spoken to most of them who use it. Some are disgusted. Some are the part of, are contributing to the problem. Um, it really, when we talk about systemic racism, we this is this is the most immediate example of our systemic classism. That we're annoyed with the folks that don't have anywhere else to go, that drink and get obnoxious and throw their trash over the bank, and our best way of dealing with that is not to do our planning first and come up with alternatives of where it is safe to drink or camp or hang out, uh, you know, potentially find incentives to not trash the place or penalties for doing so. But instead, we basically just take, take, our, take it away. And it really does feel disingenuous and punitive because, yes, it's a tight corner, but where else do we have that there's a slight roof over people's head for people who don't, they're not, people are not going to, there's a number of people who aren't allowed it another way that hang out there. But some of those same people are the ones who are uh, regularly crapping on the riverbank and y'all refuse to deal with that too. So I just needed to get that in edgewise. Uh, so you, you've got a problem in that truly you're, uh, head in the sand approach to social services. The city doesn't do social services. Well, the city damn well needs to do social services because that's what's causing that problem, which will just move somewhere else, you know? So to have not talked to Paige is really insulting that this is, you know, I've talked to Paige and she has clear thoughts about it. And she agrees with we need to address the issue that's really the underlying the elephant in the room. So I... I, I'm not, I'm, I'm so annoyed with the uh, lack of cooperation around keeping it clean, but yet if it takes a month talking to both parks and public works director and we still can't get the power washing done, I'm not sure it's just the city, uh, it's just the uh, homeless people's lack of cooperation I'm uh, speaking to, you know? Uh, so I think you get my point, and I... Uh, applaud Jack for standing up to say, hey, you know, maybe we're moving a little fast and that this is part of a broader discussion, and I'll take this opportunity to say we still need to have the discussion about Mark Johnson, you know, that was not stuck into a, the next meeting's agenda as number seven. Uh, you need to warn a public hearing and, and have that. But I think you hear my point that there's another way is not going to be the only place that certs that serves or creates a, these folks need safe, somewhat private space. They need uh, incentive to keep clean up after themselves. They need access to a place to clean themselves up so that they don't feel like they're just being crapped on by the city and therefore why shouldn't they crap back on the city? And believe me, many of them say that that's what they feel like doing, right, routinely, even on your front steps of City Hall. So. You, you are really not dealing with the issue that has been created by neglecting it for so long. And sorry my words are angry and frustrated, but uh, uh, that's what comes with the territory. Thank you. Fair enough. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. Um, other, other, any other thoughts on this? Uh, Dan, and then look like maybe Lauren. Uh, <laughs> okay, Martin, okay, maybe. <laughs> Lauren, sorry, Lauren, do you want to go first? Um, I, I guess it was a half hand because I, I feel like I'm still formulating <laughs> my thought, but um, I mean, I, I do kind of have the sense with this, you know, we're we're talking about moving this structure because of you know, a, a few different problems and issues with, with the site and location. And some of it does seem like, you know, who's using it and how. And I was, I, I guess I was curious, like, have we talked to um, 
the homelessness task force and are there, you know, if, are we creating some other issue by not looking at, you know, what's like, this is obviously serving some kind of need. So just moving it without some thought around that, you know, I'd rather have that conversation and do it knowing that we've, we've had that conversation, I guess is how I'm feeling of, you know, what, what need is it filling and why, and what are we, you know, providing instead or awareness, you know, like what's, what's, what's the alternative or is it that, that, yeah, and maybe Cameron just popped on so can provide some context. I would just be curious what that group, if they've weighed in at all. They have talked about it, but not as a formal agenda item. And so I will make a suggestion to the chair, Ken, to add that to our next agenda. And then I can come back to you with that information. Fair enough. Uh, Connor, and then oh, actually, Dan, did you have a thought? Connor can go first. Okay, go ahead, Connor. Uh, I think I'm kind of going in the same direction. It's, uh, I, I think you could say, okay, this one small structure is symbolic of all the problems that are plaguing the city, but you also could just say it would be better suited in another location. I, I don't know for sure, honestly. Um, and I think maybe having a couple of weeks just to uh, throw a few posts on social media. Um, you know, are we moving it to the best location? Does it need to be moved? What do people think about this? I, I don't think that's a bad thing. And I, I think the homeless, Homelessness Task Force is a, a good group to take a solid look at this. Okay. Um, Dan? If yeah. not, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, well, I guess I was just waiting to have everyone else here because, I, you know, I think I want to respond to some of the Things have been stated, which is, you know, I, I don't think of this as a, a homelessness problem. This is just a structure that fits poorly into a tight area. Um, and I don't think of it as a homeless issue with the trash and other sort of things, because I've certainly seen plenty of people that, you know, well, I mean, I don't know, I haven't followed them home, but do not have the do not present necessarily as, as part of the, the homeless population. They seem to be kids around town, um, you know, that these are, this is just a, it's a structure that's in a odd place. It's trying to spruce up what's otherwise a, a pavement area, but it's not a good fit. Um, and I think that we're coming into the fall and winter. So moving it um, is not an unreasonable, um, it's not in a reasonable time uh, and it can always be moved back in the spring if the homelessness task force if other stakeholders say you know this is absolutely the best place um, for this structure but I don't feel that this is you know this isn't punitive towards uh, the homelessness population um, this is just about making sure that the the park has a certain I mean sorry the bike path has a certain um, comfort level and safety for the users of it um, you know because of the radius and because of the turn it's narrow it's sharp the structure sticks very close to it and it's hard to socially distance as you're going by if somebody's at the structure and there's traffic going either way it's at a nexus point um, you know I think that you know moving it uh, I don't see where this structure would necessarily stay um in this particular spot and maybe its final spot is somewhere down the bike path or um in another uh, closer location but i think this particular spot you know is just from what i've heard of, from constituents and from what i've seen myself is just not a good fit um and i think it it may it makes as much sense to move it um to a different location and and address some of these issues i think these are important issues to address that we're all discussing. Um, I just think we have to, um, you know, we have to address this use um, of of this bike path um, that we've been hearing. Uh, that people are not don't feel like they can socially distance there. And I think it's a good, um, you know, this is a good temporary step in part of an ongoing conversation. Uh, Jay, thank you. Yeah, that, I'll agree with Dan on this. I just think that it's, um, 
I don't think that the location of this structure is totally, you know, I think we're talking about a bigger issue and, and a smaller issue. I think that the location of the structure is inappropriate given the bottleneck, especially when we're talking about social distancing right now. Um, the, it, if we if we're, want to have a broader conversation about how, as Dan said earlier, about how that corridor is used, and we've heard from people who live there and all the challenges, then I think that there, those issues are not dependent on the location of that structure. So I'd support moving the structure, but then having a broader conversation around how um, that section of the bike path is used as it, as it leads up to the transit center. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Okay, fair enough. Um, Morgan, I see that you've um, popped on here. Do you um, want to uh, address the council on this? That's why my hand's raised, yes. Okay, very good, go ahead. Yeah, so if I understand correctly, uh, back when I had been on the homelessness task force, and maybe even before that, but also after, uh, I think this is the location uh, that people have been bringing up concerns about. But back then, it wasn't whitewashed like it is right now. You know, people are trying to, you know, say it's about this and say it's about that. Back then, you know, people were saying, yeah, you know, so people using it, you know, who are living homeless and, the accusation was, you know, all the garbage and stuff was a result of them and all that. And now we don't want to say that it's people who might be living homeless say is it and you know, blah blah blah. Now we wanna like change it and and gloss over it and 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 when I say we, I don't mean me and certain other people. Uh you know, I agree with Steve Whitaker, you know, with uh, the substance of what he's, you know, saying. And and I'm glad that Jack brought this up. Um, uh, you know, so, you know, people are trying to say, well, COVID-19 and, you know, social distance, all that. Although that might have a certain application, you know, the real issue here that people are having a problem with appears to be, you know, the people that are utilizing the structure, all right? So let's talk about that, okay? You know, it's, it's all right. And the thing is, is if you wanna bring other people into the conversation, how about those who might be using that structure, you know? We're living homeless. We might be, you know, uh, n not just the homelessness task force, but people who are actually using the structure. You know, let's hear from them. You know, and, you know, before you get into discussion about, you know, getting rid of the structure, you know, you got to really talk about addressing the needs here to bring all this about, you know, and having someplace else. And as far as another way it goes, my understanding is besides some people not being able to uh, go there because they've been banned or, or uh, they can't get there, you know, my understanding is it's gonna be a limited opening and that's like next month. The middle of next month, you know, and what, what, we got like three weeks or so until that happens, you know, and it's cold, you got snow coming, you know, and if you want to address something, address what's, you know, really happening, you know, and the people that we're talking about, you know, don't whitewash it, because that's what you're doing. And that's not all right, not by me, you know, and certain others. So, you know, 
uh, don't just lay this on the homelessness task force. Don't lay this on others and don't ignore it. You know, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Morgan. I do want to just uh, assure you that I've uh, had multiple conversations with uh, folks uh, hanging out in that structure, uh, different uh, sets of folks and trying to gather as much information as I, as I can, certainly about um, who's using it and how and, um, yeah, and their thoughts on it. Um, and I'm going to, honestly, I'm going to continue to do that. Um, but uh, just in the interest of time, um, one, so one thought team is that either there's a, um, some motion that somebody would want to make or um, we can uh, put it off uh, again um, for another meeting where um, potentially after the homelessness task force has had a chance to discuss this. Um, what is what is your pleasure? Can I offer one more brief comment? Um, I think if, yeah, uh, before you do that, um, I'd like to hear from the council on this sure. point. Okay. Uh, Jack and then Jay. I'm uh, going to make a motion that we uh, put this on the agenda for whatever the meeting is, about 30 days out, four weeks out, whatever uh, date that winds up being that we uh, seek to obtain community input from a variety of people, including people who live at Girton Park or who use Girton Park and uh, with specific uh, application to, with a specific direction to the homelessness task force to uh, try to gather input and make a decision about the disposition of the structure uh, at that meeting. Second that. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Um, I saw Jay and then um, and then Stephen. If you want to make a comment, that's fine. Go ahead, um, Jay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that I made the same comment at our last meeting and around trying to get feedback from the homelessness tax uh, task force about um, the impact that moving the structure would have. I don't know that there was um, any traction on that, but I don't know. It feels to me like we're at a point where we could make a decision one way or the other. If we need to push it off, then, then that's fine, but it would be good to have a, a, a you know, a deadline so we could, um, if, if we do feel like we need public comment on this, if we have a deadline and, and actually, um, you know, empower the task force to give us a recommendation one way or the other and get the feedback that we need so we can make a decision, then I think that that's would be um, a more appropriate next step. Thanks. Okay. Um... So, Mayor, if I could, can I yeah. jump in real quick? I just want to let everyone know that their next meeting is November 18th. Um, so that their, their timeline is a little skewed right now because their normal meeting fell on Veterans Day. And then, um, so I just want to make sure that that is uh, considered in the timeline. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to go Dan and then Stephen. If we're going down this road, um, which uh, I'll be honest, I don't, I don't support because I don't think this isn't a homeless shelter. Um, there may be a certain portion of the homeless population that utilizes this, um, you know, and I think that's a question that we can uh, address. Um, but I, I'd like to see, um, any feedback that we get from the homelessness task force to be, um, you know, looking if if they identify a need that this particular structure serves um, to know of alternative locations, because why certainly am supportive of uh, meeting that need. Um, what I what I am not supportive of is this shelter staying in this particular location for the reasons I've stated before, which is, you know, I don't think it's a good location for it. So I'd like to you know, as opposed to having the homelessness task force come back and simply say, um, yes, there's a need that this shelter serves that's a function 
or part of the, the homelessness population. That's fine. Um, but I don't think that that justifies keeping this shelter in this particular location um, without looking at alternatives um, to have this in, a, in another location. Um, if that means moving it down the path to a more open area where it can be set back a little bit or, or something else, you know, I'm happy to talk about this. I just think that this particular location is a bad location for those. If, if you, if we wanted, wanted well, <laughs> one, one possibility is if, you, if, if there was an alternative, alternative motion to move it, it um, this, this evening, then I maybe one, one could vote no, uh, uh, but, but that's, um, that, that is up to you. you. So, so anyway, anyway um, Lauren, Lauren, go ahead. Well, I, I just I agree with Dan's caveat, which I don't think, think is captured, captured in the motion, motion and, you know, you know maybe Cameron, as the person who staffs the, the task force, could convey it, or maybe we want to be more clear in the motion itself um, about, you know, because I, I think there's general, uh, my sense of the council is, is moving the part you can make because of the location issues. If it's serving a purpose, then maybe there's an alternative that's better than the pump track. Um, so that's, I think, the question more so than moving it. So I think we want to be clear to the homelessness task force that if if there are, that we want recommendations, if, if this is serving a need, that they think that the structure could be, you know, useful and there are other places that would be feasible to put it. I guess that's what I would be hoping to get from, from them. So, so if that's clear to, to Cameron and, and yeah, I guess that's, that's my, my read on the conversation we were having. Yeah. Um, can, I have, can I have 30, can I have 30 uh, seconds oh, more on the No, nope. um, we're going to, we're going to keep, we're going to keep going here. Um, Jack, how, how are you, um, uh, feeling about that possibility? I think that's fine. I think it's a little much and a little complicated to put in the motion, but, uh, I, I do think, you know, Cameron's sitting here and she's hearing the entire conversation and she's uh, able to understand the, the gist of what's being said. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I, well, and also, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily the, the homelessness task force to necessarily come up with alternatives, although they certainly could um, just based on an understanding of, of the needs and, and where, but I think you know, it's it's fair enough for this. The I don't know, Bill, if if the city staff would you know have have alternative suggestions as well. Um, For locations, yeah, or you know, if if I mean, there's a lot of suppositions here. If the homelessness task force says this meets this critical need, this is what it serves, and then you know they say you you got to have a roof structure like this. Otherwise, you know, the, the, the sort of Steve Whitaker um, uh, idea that, you know, there's a population that will suddenly um, have this need that will domino into some other, whether it be the pavilion porch or, or something else underneath the uh, People's United Bank building, um, that this is, this is um, a, a clear need. I think what what I'd like to see at least is, you know, okay, well, where's an alternative location that we could at least consider for this um, in terms of those those needs? And and the city, you know, the either DPW or or Parks Department may have a suggestion along those lines. And I don't think it needs to go into the motion, but I I guess I wanted a sense from you if that if that was feasible. We can have that conversation. Let's see what people think. We haven't, so I, you know, other than people thought the pump track was a good idea, so we sort of settled on that. But fair enough, we certainly can look at other places. So something that I could use some clarity on is um, the motion as it stands right now. Does that include a, approving, or as you understand it, Jack, um, approving um, moving it? Um, while looking at these uh, like potential other locations or not? Not. My, okay. My, my proposal is we don't take any action to move it 
live right now and we have more of the discussion okay. which presumably would lead, lead to some kind of decision at the next time we take it up okay all right i just needed to make sure i was clear on that got a little foggy for me um okay other uh comments from council okay um and oh jay go ahead sorry it, it just it feels to me like we're um like we're kind of talking about two different paths like acknowledging the need to support the the folks who are utilizing the structure and also the, the the separate path being like is that structure what is needed to support them and potentially putting in a different location so i guess that's what i'm trying to come to terms with here like i'm i'm fine to i, I like I said at our last meeting, yes, we should have a conversation because there's a certain population that has utilized the structure and to the best of its, um, you know, to, to the value that it has, and we don't want to just abandon them, and that's really important. But at the same time, are we talking about where this, this particular structure should be, or are we talking about addressing the need of the people who are utilizing it as it stands now? So um, this doesn't necessarily affect the um you know the motion we can certainly have continue the conversation and i'm fine with that but i think that if we're going to have a conversation about supporting the population that uses that stretch along the river then let's whether it's with the task force with city staff whatever then let's you know, then let's address that issue and it's not necessarily complete you know directly tied to the to this one particular structure so I'm just trying to I'm just trying to establish a path forward here. And if we need community input, if we need um, more engagement, then that's great. But it's it, it's not an, it doesn't feel to me like an either or um, yeah. like this structure is what supports them. It's more about that they need support and how to best support that um, that population. So okay. I'll leave it at that. All right. Um, anything else from the council? Okay. Um, all right, so there's been a motion and a second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. And so I think we've got um, two, uh, well, I think we've got to do a roll, a roll call. Um, so I am just going to go. Um, in the horseshoe order, because that is the order that is in my head. Um, so, uh, uh, Donna. Aye. Um, oh gosh, who's next? Connor. Aye. Um, Jay. Opposed. Uh, Dan. Aye. Jack. Aye. And Lauren. Okay, so um, that passes. And um, so the, we're, we're gonna ask the Homelessness Task Force to take this up and have more community input. Um, and, and any further discussion on um, this point, anything else you wanna, you wanna say about that or about this topic? Okay. All right, so we are, um, and we'll take that up presumably after the 18th of November. Thank you. Awesome. Um, and Ken, I see you just uh, joined us. Did you want to say anything about this? If not, that's okay. Um, well, I just heard about it. Um, I look forward to picking this up at the task force. Um, I don't want to jump into something midstream. But thank okay. you. Yep, no problem. Okay. Um, all right. So we have uh, one more item on our regular agenda, um, which is discussing uh, uh, security around the time of the election. Um, and we're going to be doing this in public session, in open session. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to um, the chief and to, uh, to Bill. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and this is really mostly the chief. Uh, I do want to make a uh, uh, a clarification, I think there, it's possible that people could have misinterpreted the agenda title as having to do with election security itself. 
Um, and that clearly is the purview of the city clerk. And, uh, and I think it's well under hand. Um, well, it's in good hands, I mean. Uh, this is really about security or issues that could result as a result of the election and what might happen in the community uh, and, and just the tense times we're in. So uh, with that clarification, I'm going to turn this over to Chief Pete and uh, take it from there. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, uh, Honorable Members of the City Council. Uh, Captain uh, Eric Nordenson is also on the call with us. And we just wanted to uh, just give you kind of a heads up as to the information, everything that we've been doing to to uh, prepare um, for um, for our, uh, for for scenarios uh, as they unfold. So the uh, the first few things that we'd uh, basically the, uh, the topics we'd like to discuss are uh, potential outcomes, uh, related concerns. The steps we've taken so far, ops planning and uh, the department's focus, planned uh, events or any known th uh, threats. Again, I, and, and as I say that, I want to make sure that um, planned events aren't known threats. They're just there's two separate pots. Uh, and then uh, contingency steps that are going to be applicable to the city. So with our um, potential outcomes and related concerns, um, there are concerns nationwide of reports of uh, voter intimidation um, at polling locations uh, presence anybody who's armed anyone who wants to say that uh, that they're, they're there to maintain election security so that's something we've been in contact with uh, John Odom about and that we've been working with the uh, state's attorney's office as well as the uh, Secretary of State uh, so uh, that that's something again that uh, we've um, we have a special attention to, we'll maintain our vigilance and, uh, uh, and just continue on from there. But we have no threats, no, no information that, that suggests that we can expect something like that to occur in Montpelier. Um, the, uh, the, the potential wins in the, in the outcome, so there, there are obviously going to be four of them. Um, a Biden win, a Trump win, uh, uh, an, an unclear winner, or a contested outcome. Uh, so, uh, what what my my consideration is or, or what my thoughts is is that um if if there is um depending on i guess which which individual wins the election you may have a, a different type of of folks who are going to come so uh if uh there may be folks that are going to be in support of of biden if biden wins and then for the most part you may have uh, a group of people that are congregating and that there's no conflict there. Everyone's there pretty much for the same reason and the potential uh, for, for folks to get into arguments is going to be lower. Um, but then there are always going to be fringe elements on e on either side of, of a political dynamic. Um, so, so our concern would be uh, folks that may be disenfranchised uh, that may come up and, uh, that may want to to bring conflict to anyone who may want to uh, to gather in at the state house area. Um, so um, then then if you have an unclear winner, contested outcome, um, folks may want to uh, demonstrate. Uh, there are going to be allegations, probably on either side of the spectrum, depending on how this goes plays out, of fraud and within the election process. So again, the, the biggest concerns that we have are going to be any outside. Um, groups that may want to provoke um, the folks who are going to be gathering. Um, the results of Vermont state and local elections are unlikely to uh, directly trigger mass arrests or situations that cannot be resolved through normal means, um, through the Secretary of State or normal court processes. Uh, so again, it's local that we're not necessarily concerned with, it's just like the national level. Um, and, and there's an agreement um, with a lot of folks within our spectrum that the longer there is an unclear winner, the likelihood of an incident within the state would, uh, would possibly increase. And, and as I'm saying this, I just want to say that we're not trying to present doomsday scenarios. We always hope for the best. We're, we're hoping that everything's going to, we have, you have no indication that anything bad or negative is going to happen, but it's our responsibility to make sure that we're planning as best as we possibly can for the logistical concerns of the city, as well as the safety of people who live here and those who might come here to, uh, to express their rights. Um, when looking at uh, COVID, so uh, 
again, when you have large gatherings, that, that brings up the increased danger of resonance uh, and of, of, of having a super spreader event. So that's something else that, that we, we're, we're maintaining cognizance with. And then uh, potential media interest. The consensus is if, if something happens as, as, as the elections push on, um, that there's going to be gatherings or demonstrations in two primary areas, Burlington and Montpelier. And that's that's a general consensus across law enforcement, as well as um, uh, uh, the, the legal aspects within the state's attorney's offices and everything. Um, so uh, if the, the concern, again, would be when you have large gatherings, uh, no matter how peaceful, there may be elements that may want to take advantage of media coverage or that, that type of attention to do anything that they want to do. That's something that, again, that we're, that we're cognizant of. And then we also do have the concerns as well as the logistical elements of if there is um, uh, political individuals, uh, the elected representatives that may want to come to any impromptu rallies or situations and the logistics and, and, and safety aspects uh, and security that that also brings as well. So those are uh, things that we're cognizant about. And, uh, and the last thing to this specific topic uh, would be just to acknowledge that um, we do have limited resources, uh, not just within the department, but uh, statewide. Uh, the good news is we're going to continue strong partnerships with the Capitol Police, with the state police, um, the uh, Washington County Sheriff's Office, uh, Barry, Berlin, everyone. So everyone's on board. Everyone uh, is, is going to be willing to help us when we can do this. Um, so to the next item of that, the steps that the department has taken so far. We've, we just had this morning uh, a, a meeting uh, with uh, Montpelier Alive, with the business community to give them uh, the information that we're aware of, any recommendations or advice in increasing safety, and then just encouraging folks to notify us if they see anything that's suspicious or that, that's concerning. And in, and in response, we're going to make sure we funnel all the information we possibly can uh, so that we don't keep folks in a vacuum or second guessing uh, to, uh, to the lifeline of our community. Um, our contact with peer agencies include, again, Capitol Police, BGS, Supreme Court Security, City Clerk's Office, uh, Washington County Sheriff's Department, um, State Police, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the FBI, and um, the AOT. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much to that end. Uh, uh, Captain Nordenson, so far, is there anything that, I, um, that I'm missing, right? any input or uh, comments you want to make? No, you're doing fine so far. All right, stumbling over myself, but I'm trying. It's 10 o'clock, you're doing well. <laughs> he gives me a cookie and pats me on the head, and I appreciate that. Um, so looking at uh, operations planning and our and, and the department's focus, uh, our focus is, is primarily on the preservation of life and safety for, for, for people. Property second, people are gonna be first uh, in, in events of worst case scenarios. Um, Third, we're going to look at uh, post investigations of potential property crimes and then uh, making sure that we preserve downtown city, city property, city hall, the fire department, the police department, and city assets. Uh, what the department plans on doing is to maintain a reduced presence and that we will only respond to calls for disruption. Uh, and and uh, again, like, like we've been handling um, demonstrations and large gatherings already. Um, and, and, and again, with, with talking about safety first, uh, again, law enforcement, if, if there's if, if something bad should happen, if there should be fights or conflicts or anything, our focus is going to be uh, egressing injured civilians or first responders. And events are known threats. So thus far, we know of eight events that have been planned through the state. Um, for, for coming up. So as of today, we're aware of um, a group, uh, Protect the Results and Defend Democracy in Montpelier. They uh, have applied for um, uh, pretty much uh, to be on the State House lawn from November 4th through November 7th. The Vigil to Honor Democracy event is going to be on October 30th at 5.30. Um, they're going to have a rain day in the event that they have inclement weather for Sunday, November 4th. There's a rally hosted by the Rights and Democracy of Vermont for November 4th at 4 o'clock. The rally hosted by the Vermont Public Interest Research Group, or VPIRG, for November 7th at uh, noon. And the Vermont Right to Life will be there uh, at January 23rd, 2021 at 10 a.m. 
So those are the those are the folks that we're aware of that, that want to gather, that want to express their rights, and 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 we're going to do everything we can to make sure their logistics and their security, um, any concerns, just their safety is is, is met. Uh, we don't know currently of any specific known threats to the city or to any elected officials. And again, there's a there's a trend that we're looking for. Um, the, the Vermont Intelligence Center from the state police, they have three elements that uh, that they're looking for. And one of that is this this concerning trend that we have uh, for elected officials. So uh, so that that's part of the equation as to as to what law enforcement is considering doing uh, within its safety operations planning. So uh, contingency steps and that are going to be applicable to the city for again for a worst case scenario. Two primary things are judicial uh, declarations um, that just pretty much gives police the the opportunity or the the authority to make arrests if we're going to um, de declare folks to disperse. If we get unruly folks that are going to disperse, normally the the process is um, that we have to get um, deputies, sheriff's office to to make that announcement. But in this case, we've coordinated with the um, the state's attorney's office. So we would just be in contact with the state's attorney's office, tell them what we have on the ground. They would uh, push up affidavits to the courts, and then we would get the, the judges to give us that order uh, to, uh, to allow to, to give that, that, that order to disperse, uh, again, depending on what we see. And, and I think our department has been very good in, in restraint, and our department has very been very good at, um, at, at allowing folks to move forward. So we're not anticipating or um, any, any bad things to happen. Uh, then the, the second thing is the emergency declaration. So if there are um, things that like we're, we're seeing playing out on Philadelphia, um, if, if those elements come, then, um, then the state can, or then, then we can ask for state resources uh, to come in. And again, this is something that we're, we're hoping doesn't happen. We don't expect to happen, uh, but it's something that we're, we're, we're planning to have in the event that you know, the worst case scenario happens. So we just want to make sure that we're prepared as much as possible. And then the last bet to, uh, is to pretty much to touch on will be um, for folks in, in the public um, is to know that our department wants to push out as much information uh, as, as we know it uh, as the election time, as the general election approaches. So we would just encourage the public to look and uh, at the uh, department and the city's Facebook and home pages um, to follow uh, us, on, to, to follow the city on Twitter. And that hashtag is at VT Montpelier. And then to, for folks to also register at, at uh, VT dash alert. Um, that way, if as things start to progress, if we're starting to, to see um, uh, situations that give us concern, we push that information out to the public. Um, but again, I, I do want to emphasize we're not we're not looking for a doom or gloom scenario. It's just we just want to uh, to let everyone know that because um, there 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 have been people that have been voicing concerns. It's, it's, it's how we're preparing and and. Um, you know, at, with, with the possibility or potential for any unrest. And um, we're just just taking steps to plan and prepare. Um, Eric, you got anything else to add? Yeah, just uh, one last thing. We partnered with DPW. Uh, so in the event that uh, people take to the streets, we should be able to quickly barricade off those streets to keep motor vehicles out of there and uh, hopefully just protect the downtown core. So if it's a it's a big concern for us, um, but uh, we've, we've got it pretty well covered, we think. Super. Well, thank you so much for that update. That's really helpful. I know I've been getting questions about this as well, um, so it's really good to know um, how, how we're preparing, and um, it sounds like um, you all are on top of it, which is great. Um, other thoughts from or comments, questions from council, uh, Connor. Chief, thanks very much. I, I think it really does give people a peace of mind to hear that you're sort of five steps ahead of this and think of all these scenarios. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think we often think like in Montpelier and Vermont, we're immune to this type of thing. Um, but I, I thought it was pretty disturbing a couple months ago to see some of that Patriot front graffiti around town, right? Because, okay, sure enough, it's graffiti, but you know, this is a group that, you know, is designated by a hate organization. Um, 
by the, uh, you know, uh, ASL there. And, um, you know, you know, I think they do have potential to take action. So I, I just wanted to see if there was any follow up from that. Have you seen any presence with other groups like that in the community? Um, or do you think that was just maybe, maybe a one time thing? Um, I, I can I, I can definitely uh, do some mastering to that, but I also like to invite Eric if, if Eric, you know, if there's anything you want to say on about say about that before I uh, uh, jump into that. Yeah, kind of. We're not seeing uh, too much widespread, uh, especially Patriots front. We're not we're not seeing too much of that present in town. Uh, we have seen that you can probably see the graffiti that's out and about. Um, we have seen a large increase in that, uh, which we're trying to deal with. Some some is not very nice. Um, um, so we're doing the best we can with that as well. And, and that's one of the biggest concerns is, is the national trend is it, it's not necessarily that, uh, that, that it's communities that are causing unrest within their own um, municipalities. It's, it's, it's the concern of folks who are coming from the outside and taking advantage of the opportunity to, to do that. So that's why it's, 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 it's really important for us to make sure that we're sharing information with the VIC as well as getting information from them, which we are. Um, but yeah, we haven't seen anything that suggests other than um, that there's like a massive presence that's, that's having any plans for something like that, but it's, it's something the department is definitely keeping its eye on. Very much. Great. Uh, Lauren. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Chief and Eric. Really appreciate the, um, the update and all the work that's going into keeping everyone safe. Um, two quick questions. One, it, it sounds from the way you ran through it, like we don't anticipate, I think, you know, one thing people have watched with concern of how some federal law enforcement officials have acted. I, it sounds like we're not anticipating any federal presence. So I just wanted to confirm that. And then the other piece was, speaking to the roads, at least for the Saturday, November 7th event, I think people are anticipating that could be pretty sizable. And does it make any sense to proactively close off that stretch of street just so that there isn't traffic and there aren't cars, you know, knowing we've seen vehicles used um, to, to try to harm people and other, you know, again, just planning for, <laughs> hoping that the best, trying to plan for the worst. Um, but you know, does it make any sense to, to look at that ahead of time of closing that down or do the kind of reactive approach that you described, which sounded like you could do it pretty quickly if we were seeing concerns, but just curious your thoughts on that. Okay. If you want me to jump in real quick? Yes, please. So, okay, yeah, uh, Lauren, hopefully to put a little ease to you. I have uh, barricades already set out throughout the city uh, by the end of this week, so they're gonna stay in place. And then the city has taken up, uh, I guess, some possession of some large metal barricades that. We're putting those on standby. So I should be able to quickly, or we should be able to quickly shut down roads if in the event that we need to, uh, and then hopefully protect it with some uh, a little stronger barricades. Um, I, I think our biggest nightmare is always a car going through these crowds. And uh, quite frankly, we don't necessarily have all the tools we need uh, to prevent that. So uh, those, medical, those metal barricades will be the best we have for now. And they're supposed to be readily available for us, especially on that day. And then I guess to answer your federal uh, federal presence question, um, that they're not on our docket here. Obviously, uh, I believe the you know the, the National Guard can be available. I can't I can't call the National Guard. Um, we do have uh, have groups that we work with with the FBI, ATF. Um, you know, if we're in a pinch and people are getting hurt and they're in town and they can help us, then absolutely we're gonna we're gonna use them to help us. Uh, but they're certainly not a priority or or what you're seeing on TV to come and, and take over. And, and if I could, uh, to piggyback on what uh, what Eric had said, that uh, we are, uh, we're monitoring levels of interest in folks who may want to come down around the uh, November 7th timeframe. And, and the concern is not necessarily just like the group that's coming down. It, it, uh, it, it, and when I say concern, I mean like for logistical purposes. It's, uh, it, it's anyone who may take the opportunity to say, hey, there's already a large gathering going on. We're going to piggyback on that and, and we're going to be there too. Um, so, but we have been in very good close contact as with, with, with Matt Roy. I mean, I have to get the Capitol Police as well as with ALT. So as, as we're looking at these things and seeing these things unfolding, that's when we're going to work with the state police, work with the state to ensure safe travel on the highways as well as coming into the city. Uh, with the um, with 
So with, with those emergency uh, declaration procedures, it's going to have to be the boss. Uh, Bill is going to have to make that call um, to, uh, to get any of those resources down. Um, if the National Guard has to come in, their rules of engagement are, they've been given that issue from the Judge Advocate General on how they're going to, to work through it. it. It's primarily, it's not a law enforcement thing. It's just going to be just like a preservation of safety and life. Um, and it's, it's, it's like, and anything on top of that, they defer to us. So our rules of engagement, the, the, the ways in which we do things is going to be part of that instant command is, no, this is what we're doing. This is how we're pushing. It's not like an individual thing that you're coming to a federal building and you see uh, federal troops and they're handling their own incident. The National Guard, if God forbid something like that ever had to happen here, would just be augmenting the things and our priorities in the way we do things. Thanks so much. It's really good to know. Other thoughts, comments, or questions? Uh, Dan. Sure. Uh, just one question on, I think the first point you were talking upon, Chief, was, um, you know, is there any information about uh, election day, whether groups have planned to um, make any type of, uh, you know, either stand or, or um, voting monitoring activities outside of City Hall or around the area? Um, to our knowledge, no. We had a meeting again with the secretary, directly with the Secretary of State last week, um, and it's something they're they're watching extremely closely, in, in, as well as with the Vic. Um, and Rory, uh, our county state's attorney, is, is like way on the ball. So we're we're, we're there, there are no concerns, nothing that that we've heard um, thus far. But then again, some people don't project. Um, what their planning is. Uh, I, I think uh, John's still on the call, so John may have something else to add uh, to that. Specific physical threats? Uh, I have not heard anything, although, you know, just in general, we are told to expect uh, the possibility of poll watchers. There's poll watchers and there's poll watchers. Um, anybody can come in and observe the, the, the process, but the as far as actively going in and being prepared to challenge voters, there has been some obviously discussion around that about the country. Um, as part of his emergency authority, the Secretary of State has put a time limit for registration on that. Anyone who wants to be a formal poll worker uh, needs to make their intention known uh, by the end of the day on Friday to register. You know, if, if there's people inclined to get angry about this sort of thing that actually only could make it worse. Um, although, you know, I'm, I'm not suggesting it's a, it's a bad plan. It is. Um, you know, I, I, I should mention that, that at, at our level, and I haven't spoken with Chief Pete about this yet, but we do have an ongoing, uh, we, we have a, an, an election emergency procedures plan for everything. It was made in consultation with, uh, Chief Fakos and Chief Gowan shortly after I got here, and we and I just you know go by it every year. Um, it does. It's it's mainly on election procedures for emergencies or for election staff, um, and you know we have forty some volunteers coming in, uh, minus the the Board of Civil Authority. But in case of flooding, in case we get a call, you know opportunities. Um, again, this was done with Chief Fakos, but. To bring in uh, plain clothes officers to monitor the government. Don't blame you. Sorry. No. That's, that's all right. But um, I also have very broad authority under federal and state law. Well, I have very broad authority to manage the entire grounds. Um, but I also have very generalized authority on voter intimidation. And I've let everybody know that I'm going to enforce that extremely broadly. And obviously, if there's a problem, um, um, I'll immediately reach out to Chief Pete. And in terms of belligerence at the polls, I should also mention there is going to be a mask um, rule um, to enter the building, just as there is now. Uh, volunteers at each entrances will be instructed to, um, if someone refuses to put on a mask, and they will be provided 
that myself and another election official can actually bring them a ballot outside, let them vote, wait while they vote, and bring that ballot back in. Again, all of this is, you know, could be a different ball game if uh, someone, you know, really wants to make a stink out of it. But before bringing in the police, per se, we would follow those kinds of procedures. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, can I ask you? Can I ask a question? Um, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, what should the public be aware? I know that we have a uh, no long guns, uh, no discharge of long guns policy, but I also know folks have, uh, you know, had concealed weapons. And I expect that some of the um, population is going to want to carry long guns around. And, uh, and should the public be aware? Are, the, are those allowed to be loaded, et cetera? What, what's reportable? What, what needs to be reportable and what doesn't, you know? It's a good question. Okay, I, I, can, I can start that one off, and then I'll definitely defer to, uh, to, uh, to Eric uh, to, to help uh, finish that one off. But I think that um, first and primarily, I think that if anyone from the public sees anything that they consider threatening, or intimidating or just uncomfortable is to contact us. That way we can kind of uh, uh, take as much of the situation as best as we can, see the fluidity of the situation, and then and then apply a person, uh, then apply our, our policies and uh, as well as the state law in, in addressing that. Uh, so, so my thing is that, you know, anytime anyone sees something that they consider threatening or, or anything else, it's just to, just to err on that side of caution to give us a call to let us know and give us that heads up. And uh, Eric will probably can uh, talk about the specifics of that, that question. I can go kind of. I mean, I, yeah, I, I'm just trying to clarify what we had that scare, the whole lockdown of the Capitol complex over a, you know, a snow shovel or something. So what I don't want is people calling because, if guns are allowed, just say so. But you know, if if somebody starts aiming them, that's another story. You know, under my under statute, as I am choosing to interpret it, I will consider, and I've let folks know this, any showing of a weapon on city hall grounds, I will consider it voter intimidation, and I will ask them to leave and contact the police immediately. Um, and you know, if somebody wants to go get a judge to tell me I can't do that, they're welcome to but as far as i'm concerned that's voter intimidation so i will act under my authority to say you can't do it period that's really helpful clarification thank you and and then clarify if what if the cap, captain or chief could clarify in the, any demonstrations following the election uh are people allowed to wander around capitol complex and around the city with long guns strapped over their shoulder Eric? Yeah, thanks, Stephen, for the question. Uh, we are an open carry state. Um, I like to encourage people to open carry with some common sense. Um, as we know, common sense isn't uh, always there with a lot of people. So uh, yes, it's allowed. Uh, if anybody is threatened or has intimidation or gets pointed at somebody, that changes the ball game. Um, and that involves some people's different perceptions. So. Uh, it becomes a tricky issue with the with the right to bear arms. So, okay, thank you, um, thank Morgan. You. Uh, I uh, saw you've uh, turned your video on here. Do you have something you want to add? Well, um, first, I want to thank Chief Pete and uh, the sergeant uh, for their uh, report and their vigilance. Uh, by the Mapia Police Department on this and others involved. Um, uh, it's it's always important to um, to stay aware of these things and the potential uh, uh, that might occur. Uh, that said, uh, uh, if it's permissible, I was wondering if uh, Chief Pete might entertain a, a unrelated question. <laughs> Chief? Uh, it, it's entirely up to the mayor. <laughs> well, why don't you go ahead and ask your question, Morgan? So, Chief Pete, not to embarrass you, but while you were 
speaking there in the background a certain family member of yours was walking back and forth and so i begs the question what's the name of your family cat oh the cat's name is pascal he's named by by a daughter after she watched that tango movie okay <laughs> thank you thank you okay um any other questions jack go ahead this is more a comment than a question um i I think this has been a, a useful conversation to have. I think that uh, it makes evidence that one of the things that having a highly professional police department gets us is the uh, planning and preparedness that have been uh, evident tonight. And I uh, appreciate uh, Chief Pete and Captain Nordenson uh, for bringing this to to our attention. Um, my hope and my expectation is that as ugly as some things have been uh, in various places, my sincere hope and expectation is that we will not see anything like that in Montpelier. And uh, I certainly hope I'm right. Thank you, sir. We, we really appreciate that. And, 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 and all this being said, as we're making these preparations, these plans, we deal so fully with the intent of, of the fate and, and having faith of, of the people of our city. So we're, we're, we're very optimistic that uh, things, excuse me, things will go well also. Great. Okay, well, thank you again. Thanks for that update. And we're going to hope that things go well. <laughs> <laughs> on the on the third and and in the weeks after they also um, have another resident with their hand raised oh okay thank you thank you for letting me know um dane abernathy oh, all right dane i was just wondering if the current state of emergency would affect uh the open carry situation uh, i i to address that, because it is a COVID-related um, state of emergency, my short answer is no. No. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question, though. Um, OK. All right. Well, thank you again. And um, I think um, that is the end of our regular business. Um, so now we are on to council reports, and I'm sorry it's so late, but at least it's not as late as last time. Okay, so, um, all right, we're gonna, gonna we're gonna go around our normal order. Um, if you all get tired of that normal order, please let me know. Um, anyway, um, Donna, go ahead. I'll be brief. People vote and try to or enjoy Halloween in the safest way possible. But do play with Halloween within your family. That's all. Great. Thank you, Connor. Ditto oh, there. So, sorry we canceled Halloween, everybody. Well, <laughs> try not to cancel too many other holidays, uh, but have fun. A um, couple things. Um, I, I was wondering maybe if we should get uh, marijuana dispensaries on the agenda soon. I've had a couple of constituents reach out. Uh, just curious of what the process was and if we needed like an actual ballot item to actually be eligible for a dispensary coming up there. And I just don't know. So it might be good for us to get a sense of that because I, I do know we have folks in the community who would uh, like to see it here. Or dispense, you mean retail dispensaries? Right, yeah. Not, not the, because we already have medical marijuana dispensary. Retail, so there'll be a small number right. that would be eligible for the retail. Uh, so they yeah. be interested in that. Yeah. So re retail. Yep. So that, that'd be good. Um, I, uh, Donna and I are on the micro transit committee, which is moving along at full mm -hmm. speed. There, I'm on the public input uh, subcommittee there. Uh, so we'll be doing a pretty robust discussion with the current users of you know GMT in the in the next few weeks here. Um, I also thought it might be good to get GMT in at some point just to do a, a quick update on that as well. So that'd be good. Um, but that's it for me. Thanks. Great. Um, Jay. Uh, yeah, just I'll uh, echo Donna quickly to be safe at, uh, 
for Halloween this year, and I hope everybody gets out to vote. And just one other thing, um, so the council knows the, the school board officially stood up the school resource officer committee at their meeting this last week and our um, this la a week from t a week ago from today. And so our first meeting is next Thursday. So um, I'll certainly, I know we have another meeting uh, ahead of that, but as, as that uh, committee work progresses, I'll be sure to make sure um, you all are updated with what's happening. So thanks. Great. Uh, Dan. Oh, Dan, you're muted. <laughs> ah, just a quick brief note. Um, I've, Jay and I have been working with some constituents uh, who have been experiencing low frequency noise um, in their houses. Um, and I guess I would put it out to anyone listening, you know, if you are experiencing any type of low frequency hum, that's uh, something that would be almost sort of uh, bone shaking or irritating, um, certainly reach out to Jay and I um, and the city because, you know, we're trying to figure out where the source of this is coming from. It only seems to be affecting a very few households and it may or may not have anything to do with any city functions, may have everything to do with geography. Um, but it's certainly, for those who are experiencing it, it seems to be a very serious problem. And so certainly, if anybody out there is experiencing it, they should um, they should let, let us know. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jack. Um, two things to mention. One is that uh, the uh, Washington County Superior Court, there is a vacancy for the Office of Assistant Judge and the uh, Washington County Democratic Committee is uh, going to be putting out another call for people who might be interested in having their names forwarded to the governor for appointment. And so, you know, it's election season, it's not gonna happen right away, but any, if anyone watching thinks they might be interested in um, having their name uh, considered, they should feel free to uh, contact me and I can talk to them about what's involved. Um, and the only other thing I want to mention is that uh, we know that uh, Union Elementary School is cl closed this week because of the uh, coronavirus and uh, from what I've observed from uh, watching my uh, my granddaughter participate in uh, remote kindergarten at uh, at our house this week, I think the school has done a great job of uh, getting people prepared and uh, and managing this. And hope it won't be too long. But praise the uh, school department for what they've done. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Lauren. Uh, yeah, just quickly. I was also going to um, thank our teachers trying to manage school for two young children at home this week. Just makes me all the more appreciative of the wonderful work our teachers do. Um, but just a reminder to everyone, you know, this is a community spread issue. So wear your masks, keep your distance, stay home, do, do the things we know we need to do. Um, and, you know, but also, you know, as a couple of people have said, remember to vote again safely, but we still have lots of options of dropping your ballot off. I'm sure um, John will get into that, but also I'm just so appreciative of all the people who are volunteering and even during the pandemic, the amazing volunteerism of folks to make sure we have successful elections. So thanks to everyone who's stepping up. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to mention for maybe a future agenda is an issue that I think I'd seen kind of come on and off the agenda was looking at the PFAS issue. So this was something we'd looked at, you know, in February and then we went into lockdown and had a really interesting conversation and it's a tricky issue, but I do want to bring that back up at some point and figure out, I think there's some next steps or at least data we could be gathering to better understand the, the issue and what the city's options are. Um, so just wanted to get that back on the, on the list. 
Yeah, Lord, actually, that's somewhat on my shoulders. Uh, I was at, and I'm glad you reminded me, and I, one of us will remember, I'm actually supposed to talk to you about that at one of our weekly calls to get a sense of how we would fit that up. So Great, yeah. Because we don't really have any new information since we talked about it in February, so get a sense of what what we'd like to discuss and what information may be important. Great, thanks. And that's it. Thanks. Okay, uh, so uh, I don't have tons of new information and highly encourage everyone to vote. Make sure that you have voted. Uh, and at this point, you either need to be walking your ballot in or uh, actually uh, going to the um, to City Hall on November 3rd uh, and polls are open 7 to 7. Um, and so besides that, um, it's been said before, but I'm going to say it again. Uh, we absolutely need to be um, vigilant on wearing our masks and uh, and staying socially distanced. And that means when we're in cars with people, um, and that means when we're, you know, potentially, uh, you know, hanging out um, uh, indoors. So uh, please just keep that in mind. Um, and then the only other. Um, thing I want to um, raise is again like in the in the Lauren spirit of like br like just bringing back other like old topics um, I am just thinking about the conversation that we had some time ago about um, uh, stormwater utilities and um, and at one point um, <clears throat> we were gonna uh, there were a few folks that were interested in digging into that um, now and of course you know, it may not be something that we implement this year but nonetheless having a discussion I think could be still good um, so I think that is it for me uh, John hey so I know these are always late and lately and every time we get to me I'm like oh I'll talk about the election another time it's late I guess it's kind of now or never um, so uh, let me give you a rundown and I think some important stuff. Um, God, the election, I don't even know where to start. There's so much going on. This is a, a unique and um, uniquely challenging election. Things are actually going very, very well, thanks to an outpouring of volunteer help. We are making full use of the Secretary's, Secretary of State's extra authority that they've given to us to uh, you know, tally ballots early, such like that. It's going extremely well. I would say by the end of the weekend, we'll have about 4,000 votes already in. Um, and this is of an election that based on historical trends, I wouldn't expect to go more than about 46 or 4,700. So I'm anticipating fewer than 1,000 people on election day. Uh, which is not many at all. Of course, it's a lot if they all show up at once. That's always a lot, but we're not anticipating a lot. Uh, I'm going to have about 40 volunteers working on Election Day. It's an unusual setup. It's going to be a lot of plexiglass, a lot of, you know, directions in, directions out, nobody getting lo lots of, you know, dividers and signs, enter, exit, uh, volunteers at, at both doors directing people. City Hall will largely be cordoned off, except for that entrance where you come in and go out, and that includes the restrooms in the front. So if folks need to use the restrooms, they'll need to go around back. Uh, I think I talked to you about, you know, how I'm going to handle any um, on-site intimidation already, and uh, we will be getting our emergency procedures plan fully staffed this time. I can't always do that, but we're definitely going to have it done this time. Um, the drop box will continue to be available. Tomorrow is the last day, given how the closing of the building on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, tomorrow's actually the last day the clerk's office will be open to the public before election day. So um, something to be aware of, but the drop box is always there. We are again foregoing uh, Saturday early voting hours because of, of all this. Um, as far as I, it, you all probably read some of the extra, as far as cyber stuff goes, some of the extra um, 
measures that I'm taking as part of a couple pilot projects we're involved in, uh, including storing our own data in a discrete off-site location in case for some reason the Secretary of State's data is compromised. We will have our separate, we will work into it. That data is being fingerprinted and the fingerprint stored into an impenetrable virtually. Um, blockchain so that if there's any tampering whatsoever with our with our you know separately kept and maintained data um i will know it and we can go to backups there will be no no slipping by that particular alarm system uh i've also got a microsoft corporation cybersecurity professional specifically assigned to me through a university of chicago um pilot program so if there is an immediate concern um, I can go, I have that person right there before having to work through the, the Secretary of State's office or, you know, if, if our on-site IT is not in the position to deal with it. So, I mean, those are really great things I'm really happy about. Uh, as far as are there threats, um, you know, I haven't heard anything specifically. I, I have no reason to believe there's going to, you know, a specific threat to uh, Montpelier. Um, having said that, um, it is still a state capital, as small as it is, and always have to be vigilant of that. If someone wants to make a big splash, we may be a small target, but it'd be a way to make a real loud nationwide splash to, to upset things here. And, um, you know, I, I look forward to working with everybody in the building. If I had working with you on that, I was actually recently took part in a cyber reason uh, roundtable uh, exercise that really involved and pushed the idea of all the elements of, of um, you know, the election process from the administrators to public safety, all basically working as a system. And it's an approach you're, you're starting to see more and more around the country. And it's a, it's a terrific one, a holistic way to look at it. Now, a few weeks ago, and I'm almost done. Um, as of several weeks ago, there was no specific noise. If anything, things were pretty quiet. Um, but my information now coming from the election uh, infrastructure support group, because uh, it's public infrastructure now, just went off the charts. Um, I got my first red report, which I'm not allowed to share, um, but um, let's just say there are a lot of targets around the country, including hitting Vermont. I've gotten several, and some of the other clerks have sort of not as crude as usual attempts to make inroads into election administration offices, sort of phishing or pre-phishing. And some of them are clever and they are hitting this state. So we're being vigilant about that. I also understand very recently that there is, there are reports, um, you know, from NSA and such that there is a significant infrastructure in place that, that could potentially, um, you know, impact elections that could be weaponized. So everyone is extremely vigilant. Like I say, I have no reason to believe that not just, um, you know, Montpelier, but the entire state of Vermont would for any reason be targeted, but you just don't want to take that for granted. So I think that gives you the, um, the sort of broad report going into next week. Hmm. Thank you. There's a lot to chew on there. Uh, Bill. Oh, but, but before we go on, um, can you just say again the, the hours that it'll be open? It, is it at 7 to 7 um, um, on Saturday? It is. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Okay. And Bill, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I, I don't have anywhere near as much, but uh, that was really fascinating. Thank you, John. Um, so for us, we will, of course, City Hall will be open next Tuesday. Um, we may have, so I am giving, because there can be so many people in the building where normally we're giving all our City Hall folks the option of working remotely that day if they choose, if they feel uncomfortable with all the traffic here. So um, although City Hall will be open for voting, there may be um, not a lot of in-person access. So uh, I know some people may want to come in and do double duty. Uh, some of us will be here in person, but uh, many people, may, I don't know who's going to choose, but they haven't told us yet, but just so you know. And then similarly, I know Cameron mentioned this during the uh, 
COVID update, but as we watch the cases locally, we're at least thinking about, you know, should we go back to closing City Hall uh, all the time? And even this experiment we've had here at, at the City Council meetings, now we've, you know, we've had one person in two meetings attend, uh, but it is a nice feature, but, you know, should we think about closing that back down? So we haven't made any decisions yet, but uh, just thought I'd let you know that those are the kinds of things that are on our minds along with, of course, all, all the other work of the city government. So uh, that's all I have this week. Great. Okay. All right. Um, well, thank you, everyone. And uh, hope you have a good rest of your evening. And so I'm going to uh, declare this meeting adjourned 1037. Have a good night, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.